in the end, when we face Jesus, we're face to face with him, and he says the words that we long to hear, those of us who are followers of Jesus, well done, good and faithful servant. What is he commending, really? What is he commending the faithful servants for? What is the well done for when he says that? Will he be commending our Bible reading and our, our prayerfulness? Will he be commending us for abstaining from sin? Oh, you didn't steal anything. You didn't kill anybody. You uh, didn't commit adultery. You didn't do these things. Well done. Is that what Jesus will say? Is that what he means? Or will he say, well done, you are faithful to the mission. And I think it's important for us, if we're to look at our Christian lives, it's important for us to think, what is Jesus commending us for when he says, well done, good and faithful servant? Many times we focus on abstaining from sin and personal piety, right? We come to church, we we do the Christian practices, our spiritual practices, and we think that that's the sum. That sums up what it means to be faithful, good and faithful. But I believe, and we see it in this text, that what Jesus is really going to commend are those who were faithful to the mission, the mission that we all have as witnesses of the gospel. That's what faithfulness will be commended for. So when we think about what it is that we measure our Christian life by, we ought to be thinking, how faithful am I to the mission that God has given to me? The Great Commission, go into all the world and make disciples of all the nations. That's the mission. But oftentimes, we, we in our minds, what preoccupies us is getting through our checklist our spiritual checklist, right? Making sure we have our quiet times and, and we're practicing the, the disciplines. It's kind of like thinking about being a soldier. If you're a soldier on the battlefield and you spend your time on the battlefield, shining your shoes, pressing your uniform, making sure you look the part, but you never go into the battle, then that's kind of what it is sometimes to do the Christian life without actually engaging in the mission of the Christian. And so we are not just called to shine our shoes and, and get our, our piety right. The reason that we abstain from sin and do spiritual practices is because it trains us for the mission. It trains us for the battlefield. That's the point. So what we're doing here is really for us to be faithful out there to be faithful to the mission that, that Jesus has for us. And that's what we see here in chapters 10 and 11. Just for us to get some context again, we've gone through seven seals, right? Or not quite gone through the seventh. We've always kind of paused at six, and then there's this pause. And then we get to six, seven trumpets, but again, we've got through six, and then we haven't gotten to the seventh yet. And here we are in the pause between the sixth and the seventh trumpet judgments. And this pause is another place where John is receiving another vision that's really important. You remember the first pause? The first pause between the sixth and seventh seal was the pause that asked us this question. Who can withstand the wrath of the Lamb? Who can stand against the judgments that are coming? The horses and the and the uh, all the 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 demonic forces that are coming from the bottomless pit that are permeating through the earth. Who's going to stand through that? And then we had the answer to that is those who God seals. Those who God seals. Remember, and then it went on, but then. Trumpet sounded, and before the seventh seal, in the seventh seal, we have these trumpets that are sounding that all kind of coincide together with the seventh seal, and these trumpets that are sounding are more judgments that are coming, but now this pause, and so this pause is asking another question. 
And the question is, what are the sealed people of God to do? What are the sealed people of God to do? So who can withstand the wrath of the Lamb? The sealed people of God. But what are the sealed people of God to do? And the answer to that is to be faithful witnesses, to be faithful witnesses. That's the answer to the question, and we'll discover that in chapters 10 and 11. So what are we to do? We're to be what? Faithful witnesses, faithful witnesses, right? So first, when we look at chapter 10, John sees an angel, and it's not an ordinary angel at all. It's an angel that shares the attributes of Jesus himself. Just look at verses one. Verse one. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun, and his legs were like fiery pillars. This is lifting all these attributes that we saw of Jesus from chapter one. But it's an angel. And then it says, uh, verse 2, he was holding a little scroll which lay open in his hand. He planted his right foot on the sea and on his left foot on the land, which indicates that he has authority both over land and sea. Again, this is Jesus. Jesus has is Lord over all of the earth. He has absolute sovereign authority. And then he shouts, and it's the, sh it's the voices of seven thunders that speak. Now, when you see seven again, right? We've seen seven seals, seven trumpets, seven. We're going to see seven bulls later. But seven thunders, John is kind of used to this rhythm by now. And he said, oh, I better get a pen and start writing this one down because it looks like another series of seven. That's coming. But look at what the angel says. When the angel seven, when the seventh thunder spoke, verse four, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven say, seal up what the seven thunders have said. Do not write it down. Stop, John. You're a good prophet. You want to articulate the message of the thunders, but don't. That's not to be revealed. So we do not know what God spoke through those seven thunders. But if it's been anything like the other sevens, the seven seals and seven trumpets, there are probably more judgments, seven judgments, seven more judgments, probably, but don't reveal it. Don't reveal it. It's kind of like we say often, boy, if God told us everything we had to endure when it comes to being a Christian, we might not have signed up, right? <laughs> We might not have said, yeah, I'm in with all that we have to endure as Christians. It's, I think that's why perhaps God says, no, don't, don't share this part. This is too much. <laughs> it's already been a lot, but maybe there's a line that God is saying, nope, don't, don't share the thunders on this one, perhaps. That's my guess. That's my guess on that. But then verse 5, then the angel I I had seen standing on the sea and on the land raise his right hand to heaven, and he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in it, and the sea and all that is in it. You get the idea? This is an angel who is speaking on behalf of the Lord, right? He is definitely a messenger of God. That's the point. This message from the angel is a message from Jesus. And what does he say? There will be no more delay. No more delay. The, tr the trumpets are going to sound. The judgments are going to land. It's the last bell. It's the final call. God is going to totally make it all right. He's going to renew all things. No more waiting. No more waiting. But in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. So it's going to be all over soon. No more delay. But then there's this strange invitation that this voice gives to John and says, you see that little scroll. It's a little scroll. It's in the hand of this mighty angel. John is told, go and take it. Now, I imagine myself as John, and I'm, I'm thinking, whoa, the last scroll that I saw was only opened by the lamb who was worthy to open that scroll. No one else was 
worthy to open it. I don't know if I can do this, right? That's what I would do. But John is obedient. And he goes to that angel, this mighty angel, takes the little scroll. He says, uh, give me the scroll. I was told, someone told me to take the scroll. Would you give me the scroll? And then a very strange instruction is given to him. Yeah, take the scroll and then eat it. Eat the scroll. Eat the scroll. And it will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth, it'll be as sweet as honey. So what is this scroll? It's the gospel. It's the gospel message. If you know the gospel, then you know when you receive the good news that the Lord of all the universe descended and became a human being like us and died on the cross and took our sins upon him as our perfect sacrifice and rose from the dead so we could have new life. That's good, right? That tastes really good. But then it's the angel tells him when you eat it, it's going to make your stomach sick. And what's that about? That means that anyone who receives this gospel is now a messenger of this gospel. And when you give this message away, you're going to have rejection. There's going to be people who won't accept it. They won't accept it. And that's going to make your stomach turn, right? So here's the first thing about being a faithful witness. We're called to be faithful witnesses. The first thing that faithful witnesses need to to be, we need to be witnesses who are transformed by the message. We need to be people who are transformed by the message. That's why the angel says, eat the scroll, ingest it. Let the word of the gospel transform you. It's Romans 12 too, right? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is taking the word of God to another level in us. So that it goes inside of us and stays in and does its work, right? This, this is not just Bible reading, then, is it? What is this? It's contemplating it. It's reflecting on it. It's discussing it. It's what we do on Thursdays. It's when you get together and you say, what does this word mean? What does God mean by these words? And how do we live it out? See, that's how it gets in us. And once it gets in us, what happens? It's like Jeremiah. Remember Jeremiah, the prophet? Jeremiah was the one who was told, you're going to be a prophet. You're going to speak my words and no one's going to listen to you, right? And so Jeremiah, he's in this place where he receives the word and then he tries to keep it to himself. He tries. And then what happens? He says, I couldn't do it because he says, your word was like a fire in my bones, it had to come out. I had to get it out of me. And this is what happens for us. The more that we have this gospel in our bones, the more that we'll have to say it, the more we'll have to share it. It'll be a fire in us. We can't keep it inside. And so if we're going to be faithful witnesses in our world, we need this word to really transform us from the inside out. And that means reflecting on it, contemplating it, discussing it, practicing it. We have to be a people who not just speak the gospel, but live the gospel out so that our lives reflect this good news that we are a people saved by grace. And so when someone looks at, if you're married, someone looks at your marriage, they're going to say, oh, that's a marriage that is a marriage of grace. Oh, I see your friendships. I see the way that you offer grace. Why? Because this gospel of grace has transformed the way you do life. Eat the book. Eat the gospel. Get it in you until it changes the way that you live. That's the point of being a faithful witness. We need to be a people, before we start speaking it, we need to be changed by it, right? Before we speak it, we need to be changed by this gospel. So that's the first thing. So once, once he tastes it, he eats it, and the same thing happens. His stomach gets kind of sick. But then he's told this in verse 11. Then I was told, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. John is being recommissioned as a messenger of the gospel into the world. 
And so he goes out and he's to go out to all the people's nations, languages, and kings. So this is it. Once it's in us, now we're commissioned to go and share it, but it's got to be in us first. It's got to be in us first. So have you been taking in the gospel every day? Have you been ingesting it? Is it shaping the way that you see your family life, your workplace? Is it shaping the way that you see yourself? Well, if it is, then you're ready to go and deliver it. You go, go and share it. That's the first thing. So to be a faithful net witness, we need to be transformed by this gospel. The second thing is to be a faithful witness, we witness as those protected. That is so important. We are witnessing as those protected. We go into chapter 11, and then there's this, all of this Old Testament symbolism that comes up again and again and again. So in the very first few verses, I'll read it. I was given a reed, like a measuring rod, so a ruler, and was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar and its worshipers. Exclude the outer court. Don't measure it because it's been given to the Gentiles and they will trample on the holy city for 42 months. So what is this? Well, there's a temple, right? But we know there's no literal structure or building of a temple. What is the temple? God's people. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? 2 Corinthians 6. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which means us together, our one body, the body of Christ, is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So John is told to go and measure the temple and measure the temple on the inner sanctuary only because there's an outer court and there's an inner sanctuary. So measure the inner sanctuary. What is this? The temple is the holy, is the God's people. The inner court are where God's people are protected in the holy of holies. Those who are sealed are brought into the holy of holies, and they are protected because that's where God's presence is. God's presence protects the people of God in the inner sanctuary. But then there's this outer court, and then it says that that place, anyone who's in the outer court is going to be trampled on. Trampled by who? By demonic forces, by evil spirits, by, by the ruler of this air. Okay, so what, what John is being told is there is the temple of God, that's the people of God, and we're protected. Now, it doesn't mean that, that the hostility is not going to come against us. It's going to come against us, but we're going to be protected by God. Okay, those on the outside are those who are not sealed. Those are unbelievers, those who do not share the faith. They are out there and they are vulnerable and they are persuaded and they are deceived by the enemy. But those of us who are called to be witnesses, we need to remember something. We go out as those who are protected, we are kept. Now, that, again, this doesn't mean that we're going to be insulated from suffering. doesn't mean we'll be insulated from trials or insulated from tribulation. When we share our faith, we are going to get pushback. We're going to get rejection. But the protection is this, nothing, whatever they say, nothing will ever separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Nothing will separate you from the Holy Spirit who has sealed you and protects you and guarantees you like an engagement ring on your finger that you're going to get to the wedding, the marriage supper of the Lamb. You are going to be protected. Don't worry about your life. Don't worry about your future. That's taken care of because God is present and protecting your life. Isn't that good? Now, what is, the, what is the one fear that we have when we share the gospel with others? Rejection, right? We fear we might be rejected or we might have some backlash or we might be outcast or we might be marginalized. We might be put out there to the side. We might be left out, all of those things. But the greatest thing that you could ever have in your life will never go away, that you are kept by the love of God. You are in and protected 
in the love of God. You belong to him. So even if your workplace starts to shun you because you have a different set of morals, it is based on the ethics of Jesus. You have different ideas about what marriage and sexuality and all these things should look like, and you get kind of put over here. That does not mean you don't belong. It just means you don't belong to them, but you still belong to him. You will always belong to him. And that's important as faithful witnesses of Jesus. Amen? All right? So they may reject you. They will reject you. I mean, if you get nine, if you get one out of 10 people who receive Christ, you know what? Well done. Well done. That just means nine people just rejected you, though. So, all right? That's okay. If you're going to be a good baseball player, you're going to come up to bat and seven times out of 10, you're going to strike out or get out, right? Seven out of 10. That still means you're going to be in the major leagues. You're, you're a good baseball player. You're hitting 300, right? Same thing with, with being a faithful witness. If we, if we are going to be a faithful witness, then how are you going to deal with the rejection? You need to know, no matter what they say, I belong to him. And nothing can separate me from that. So every day, that's what we do. Lord, I belong to you. This was um, the first question in the Heidelberg Catechism was, what is your only comfort in life and death? It's the first question. And the answer is, my only comfort in life and death is that I belong, body and soul, to my Savior, Jesus Christ. That's my only comfort in life and death. That is the comfort we have when we share the gospel with, of Jesus. So this is important. We're protected. We're protected. Now, there's a few things here. We've covered the temple. The temple is the people of God. But then there's also this, this issue of 42 months. What is this? 42 months. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months. There's a lot of ways you can get at 42 months. Three and a half years. That's three and a half years, okay? Okay. 42 months was how long it took for the people of Israel to leave Egypt in slavery. And then, so that took about two years, right? And then it was 40 years in the wilderness after they rejected God in the promised land and his promise, right? So 40 plus two, 42. All right. 42. So also 42, it was three and a half years where Elijah declared there would be a famine in Israel. It was 42 months that there was a famine in Israel. And it wasn't until after the 42 that God sent rain. Okay. So wilderness, famine. Jesus's life and ministry took about 42 months, right? His ministry portion of his life right? From about age 30 to about 33 and a half. That was the sum of Jesus's life. If you're to take those three things, you can say that we too, we share in experiences of wilderness, of famine, and the persecution and sufferings of Jesus. In the same way, we are called to go through that life, the cross-formed life. In the wilderness. That's what life is. Right now, when is that? That's now. From the time Jesus ascended to the time he comes back, that's what that is. So that 42 months, that's not a literal number. That's not something that's in the future where, oh, when's that three and a half years going to start? No, that's now. It's a symbol. 42 months is a symbol of the life we're in. We are in a life of wilderness. We're in a life of famine. We're in a life of sufferings because this is the life we're in, in a world that's hospitable hostile to the kingdom of God. It's a clash of two kingdoms, and we're in the middle of it. That's what life is, okay? But it won't last forever, and that's important to know. God will protect us in the wilderness. God will protect us in the famine. God will protect us in the suffering, just as he protected Jesus. Now, Jesus died, but even then, well, remember what Jesus said? Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. So do we. We may face death. Not Maybe the odds are not good that any of you are going to die for your faith. But even if that happens, he protects us. He keeps us. We're guaranteed a life with him. 
All right. So that's the second thing. Witnesses are protected, protected by God. Third thing, witnesses are empowered by the spirit. Ooh, this goes to your prayer request, Mary Lee. You are empowered by the spirit of God. So it's not up to you to figure out how brilliant you can be in figuring out Reno. It's not up to you. It's up to the spirit of God to give you that insight in those words. And that's where we get verse three. Right. Chapter 11, verse three, I will appoint my two witnesses and they will prophesy for twelve hundred and sixty days, which, by the way, is three and a half years. OK, three and a half years again, clothed in sackcloth. They are the two olive trees and the two lampstands and they stand before the Lord of the earth. So many Old Testament symbols going on here. But all of that to say that there are witnesses, two witnesses. That's us, right? There are not literally two witnesses. They symbolize us in our witness, okay? So that's that's the thing to see. We are those witnesses. They prophesy for 1260 days, right? That's still a symbol of this time, the wilderness, the famine, the suffering. We are to share the gospel during this time, Okay. There are two olive trees, olive trees that's lifted right out of Zechariah, which talks about um, the oil of the olive trees, right? You know, olive trees give oil, olive oil. You cook with it. You put it in your dishes. It also fuels you. It gives you power. What is this representing? If you go back to Zechariah, it is this picture of the olive trees. And then God says, it, it's not by might, not by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. Thank you, Bob. So we have the olive trees, which remind us that our power comes by the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God. And the two lampstands. Remember the last time we saw lampstands? Remember that? Lampstands? What do the lampstands represent? Going all the way back to chapters one, two, three. Church. Yeah. The church, remember the seven churches? There were seven lampstands. Each of those represented a church. Now there's two, which is interesting because if you remember from the seven churches, how many of those churches were actually faithful churches? Two. Two faithful churches, right? And that is the church that is faithful in its witness of the gospel. So this two witnesses is really symbolic. It is symbolic that represents the faithful witness of the church, but empowered by the spirit. You cannot share the gospel without the Holy Spirit doing this incredible work, right? Because if we look at if we think of the gospel, the gospel is like an unveiling, right? It lifts the veil from people's eyes because Jesus is hidden from the unbeliever. Jesus is not seen. He's not known. It is only through the Holy Spirit lifting the veil, pulling back the curtain that an unbeliever can truly see who Jesus is. And that only comes when we share the gospel. So this goes back to the power of the gospel. It is the gospel that is the power of God unto salvation. What does that mean? That means that when I speak the, the gospel, the Holy Spirit takes that gospel and works in a, a person's life. But when I speak that gospel, that also means the spirit of God is the one speaking through me. He's the one who gives me the power. So you see the cycle here? The spirit of God is the one who gives me the divine resources to speak this gospel into the lives of others. And this spirit also transforms others as it goes through them and it brings them back to God. So you see the cycle comes from the spirit, goes through us, meets, a pe meets people, transforms them, brings them back to God, right? It's the cycle from God through us to them back to God. That's the power of the spirit of God that we get to be part of. So often we, we get afraid in our witness because we think it's about this, it's me and the person, me and the person. And it's this back and forth thing that's going on. When in reality, in the sharing of the gospel, it's a cycle. It starts with God and his spirit working through us. 
and then through that person, and then back to God. And then God continually gives us more insights, gives us more words to say. It goes into their lives, the, and then the curtain gets peeled back, peeled back, peeled back, peeled back, until that person is now alive unto God. That's how it works. So it's never this. It's never this conversation. Because if it's just this, I'm always thinking, oh, what is the right thing to say? You know, what, what's that brilliant little zinger I can come up with? Or what's that apologetic that I can, you know, re reply back to their, you know, argument, whatever I can. And that's all good work. That's fine. Read apologetics. All of that's great. But it relies on the spirit of God. That's where we get the power to witness. Okay. So this is, this is what he's saying. He's saying witnesses who are faithful, who receive that commendation at the end where Jesus says, well done, good and faithful servant, are those who are faithful to the mission in the power of the Spirit, in the power of the Spirit. So how much of our, of our dependence is on ourselves and our own striving and our own trying to figure it out on our own? And how much of it is really depending upon the spirit of God who is within us? This is so important. I always, uh, whenever I, I, I give a weekly quiz to my, my history students, and my, my students have, have come to this point where they always want me to pray before the quiz. And, and they've, they've gotten to this point because they freak out. You know, they all stress out over this quiz. They don't, they don't know if they are going to remember everything. And so, you know, sometimes I'll just start handing out the quiz and it's like, wait, 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 you got to pray first. And so I pray because the prayer that I pray is usually something like this. Lord, help us to remember that we never take a quiz by ourselves. We're always taking a quiz with you. So help us to always remember that. Help us to draw everything that we need from you in order to recall and be at peace and do our best right? Same thing in witnessing. We never witness by ourselves. We witness as those who've been transformed by this gospel. We witness as those um, who, who have the power of the gospel within us and the spirit of God, and we, we witness as those who've been protected. That's a lot, you know? When you go into a conversation with that reality, then you can you can withstand a lot. Now here's here's the thing. The rest of this of chapter 11 going up to verse 14 is giving us this picture of what happens. What does this look like when faithful witnesses impact the world? What does it look like when we're out there? What's the impact of a faithful witness? Well, it starts in verse verse 5 and says there's going to be backlash. Right. So here, here it starts. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. Whoa. So what is this saying? It's saying those of you who are faithful witness, you're going to get backlash. But the power of the gospel is the power that will condemn those who resist and reject your testimony. And this power of the gospel is going to leave them judged and condemned. Whoa. Okay. So that's what makes our hearts ache. If someone rejects us, you know what that means? They're just putting themselves in the crosshairs of God's judgment. And so what does that allow for us? It allows us to have compassion, doesn't it? It's like, oh, you're rejecting the one message that will save you. Don't do that. Right? So they will die. And then it says in verse six, they have the power to shut up the heavens so that it won't rain during the time they're prophesying. They have power to turn the waters into blood, strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. It sounds like Moses, right? That's what God is saying. This is you, the people of God. You will have authority to do signs and wonders in all the world to verify the message is the gospel, to verify the message you will be given powers that say to the world, no, this is for real. Pay attention. This is coming from God. Wow. So the church is going to be harmed. It, it is not going to be insulated, but there's going to be a judgment that comes upon those who reject the message. 
All right. Now, verse seven, when they have finished their testimony, there will be a time when we're done. That's amazing. There will be a time when we will be done with our mission. It will be done. When that happens, the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them, overpower them, and kill them. And again, this goes back to that trumpet judgment of the demons who come up from the abyss, the demons that come up from the bottomless pit. Okay, if you go back to the trumpet judgments, you see that, right? This is all part of that. There will be a greater demonic influence, and it'll be recognizable. Like, people will know, whoa, there's severe backlash coming against God's people, that is demonic, right? You ever you ever look at a tragedy or you look at a genocide or murder that's happening, even in our world today, and you go, that can only be explained by the demonic, right? That is so evil that that must be de- demonic. That's what's going to happen as this backlash increases. It will be increasingly recognizable. This is from hell this pushback that's happening. And what will happen? They will be overpowered and killed. Their bodies will lie in the public square. Um, That means that, that the path that we take as witnesses may lead to great suffering. But it should be no surprise, this is the path that Jesus took. But here's the thing we need to remember, that path is the path of victory. When Jesus suffered and died. He died knowing the joy that was set before him. We, when we share our faith and get the backlash, we do so knowing the joy that is set before us because we're following the same path as our savior. And so we too will share in this joy. And that's what we see. Verse nine for three and a half days, again, three and a half Is it literal days? No, it's just a symbol for the same thing, the same tribulation, the same period of time. There will be people who look at the sufferings and the martyrs of Jesus and leave them there. These are the people who just reject the message and say, ha, look at that. We're tired of your message telling us that we're going to face judgment, telling us that we need a savior. We're tired of that. We don't need a savior. We're fine. And they're going to gloat over the martyrs. And then verse 11, after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them. They stood on their feet. Terror struck those who saw them. Whoa, they come back to life. This is the resurrection, the resurrection of of believers. And, And what happens here? They're called up. Come up here. A loud voice from heaven calls. And they go up. Now, this is God raising his people from the dead. Now, what happens? Those who are left in verse 13, it says, at that very hour, there's a severe earthquake. A tenth of the city collapses. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake. But here's the focal point. Here's the focus. And the survivors were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. Now, let's just unpack this a little bit. There's a lot going on here, right? In the end, we will finish. Our job will be done. But then evil will come and bring great suffering on the church. We'll be left for dead. God will then raise up his people. It'll be the sign of vindication. These are my faithful witnesses. I raise them up from the dead, just as he did for Jesus, right? Jesus was faithful, and so God raised him from the dead. Same for us. When we're raised, then unbelievers, there will be an earthquake. There will be great devastation. This is the judgments of God. But I want you to notice how many people die. And and what portion of the city is destroyed? It's a tenth of the city and 7,000 people. Okay? If you thought today a tenth of the world collapses, A tenth of the cities of our world collapse. How many people would you think would die in such a devastation of earthquakes? Probably a lot more than 7,000, right? A lot more than 7,000. This is actually a mercy. What God is saying here is there is going to be a time when I will show the world the resurrection is true. 
through you. The faithful witnesses will be raised. What happens? A tenth of the buildings of all the cities leveled, but there will be only 7,000 who are killed. The rest, the survivors, it says, are going to look at all this and go, whoa, God truly is the living God, and they give him glory. So you see in all, in all of our discoveries of these judgments, as devastating as there are, there's a mercy inside of them. That even on this day, the faithful witnesses and their lives, even in their martyrdom, bear witness, even in their death, that God truly is the Savior of the world and gives opportunity to others who have yet to receive him to still receive him. That's an amazing thing. So this is a picture of the faithful witnesses of the people of God. Do we see it? We're to go out in the wilderness. We're to go out in the famine. We're going to go out in the suffering, just as Jesus did, because we're living in a hostile world. Now, here's, here's the thing we need to remember. Right now, we've got it pretty good in this country. If you, got it, if you really think about the place that Christians have in this country, it's been, it's been a good ride. We've had a lot of influence in our culture from the, its inception. We've had so much in terms of Judeo-Christian values and our morals and our ethics. It's in our laws. It's in our system of justice. It's in our ethics. So there is that. We see it in, in, in hospitals and in schools. We've seen this Christian influence. And so we've had a place. We've had a place of influence as Christians, but that may go away. In fact, if we look at this context, it doesn't look like Christians have much power, do they? It doesn't at all. It looks like Christians are on the margins. And I think this, this text is so helpful for us to prepare for being faithful witnesses from the margins, where we don't have places in the halls of Congress, where we don't have places in City Hall where we can speak into the culture. People are not going to listen the way they used to listen. I mean, I just think about the role of a pastor in a neighborhood. That's changed quite a bit. 20, 30 years ago or 20 years ago, if I was you know, telling people I'm a pastor, there might be some credibility. People might hear me a little bit more. People might welcome me in their homes. Now, when I tell people that I'm a pastor, now I represent this institution that is suspect, that's hypocritical. Why would I want a pastor near me, actually? You know? So there's been this real switch. There's been a flip. And now Christians are being moved to the margins. Now, when Christians are moved to the margins, does that mean that our witness is now no more? Not at all. Look at our world. Look where Christians are on the margins in our world. Look at the Christians in Iran right now. There's great renewal and revival happening in Iran when Christians have no power. Christians in Kenya right now, where there's so much going against Christians, there's great renewal happening among Christians in lots of parts of Africa where Christianity is really not, is on the fringes of society. So can we be faithful witnesses from the margins? Absolutely. And I would say the greatest successes of the church have come when Christians have been on the margins. That's where our faithful witness really shines. So what I see today are Christians who are so caught up with the loss of power, the loss of place. Like we, we want our place back. And so you can react in two ways. One, we can push back and try to grab more power. Let's get power back. Right. Or we can just be passive about it and say, Oh, just let it slip away. We'll withdraw from society. We don't want to engage. We don't need to be faithful witnesses anymore. Both of those are bad reactions, right? Jesus is saying, no, there's a third way. It's not about grabbing power, and it's not about being passively dismissed and withdrawn on the margins. It's about being faithful witnesses as marginalized people, just as the church has been for centuries. It's not a new thing for the church of Jesus Christ in the history of the church to be faithful witnesses from the margins. So can we get used to that? 
Can we get used to being Christians who are on the margins, who don't have the power and influence in our society that we did? Can we, can we be okay with that? There's a lot of Christians who are not okay with that. And to me, when I see Christians who are just grabbing power, grabbing power, it's kind of exposing the idolatry of power that we have as Christians. We don't need power in order to be faithful witnesses to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We don't. We just need to be faithful witnesses who are protected by the power of God, who are empowered, not by Congress, but by the spirit of God, right? That's the power. That's where the power comes from. It's not by might nor by power, but by the spirit of God. This is where we can be faithful to the mission. So in the end, when we stand face to face with Jesus and he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Oh, isn't that the legacy you want to leave? You want to leave that legacy of being a faithful witness in the world and, and believe us, believe, just believe this. We, we may not see the fruit of it. A lot of people died before they saw the fruit of it, right? A bunch of faithful witnesses died before they saw all these survivors who glorified God because of your faithful witnesses, right? Think of all the Sunday school teachers who taught Sunday school and just faithfully witnessed to the kids, but never got to see the fruit until these kids grew up and then they turned to Jesus, right? Same thing. Just be faithful, be faithful, but do it in the power of God. Do it as one protected by God, right? That's where we get it from. And let this gospel just transform us first so that when we share the gospel, we're not sharing the gospel as those who are better than anybody else, right? Because one of the things you see, if you look, just we ran out of time on this, but one of the things you see in chapter 11 is these people who are the two witnesses, they're dressed in sackcloth. They're not dressed with Rolex watches. They're not dressed with nice tuxes out there in the world. They're dressed in sackcloth. Why? Because the message we give does call people to repentance. Sackcloth is kind of the, the clothing of repentance, but it also means that we are a people of repentance, that we're continually needing the Savior to save us. We need him and his life in us to renew us and make us holy. So as faithful witnesses, we're never the experts telling everybody else what to do, right? We're just those who are sinners saved by grace, offering another lifeline to other sinners who need that grace too. That's how we offer the gospel as faithful witnesses. So can we, will we, on that day, hear those words? Well done. Well done. Good and faithful servant. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, help us to understand and embrace what it means to be a faithful witness. Lord, that we would let this gospel so transform us so that people can see, not just through our words, but through our lives, what a what a gospel-transformed person looks like. Lord, help us to reflect on your word, to be a people of your word, but also help us to go out knowing that your spirit protects us and empowers us. Help us to trust that in every conversation, your spirit is right there. We never witness alone, but your spirit's right there to give us words. Help us to trust you for that. And Lord, help us to take the risk of faith, to trust you, that you will do that work through us. So Lord, we long to hear those words. And Lord, keep us faithful until that day. In Jesus, your name we pray. Amen.